Ich dachte, den stellst du leise. Okay. Ähm, so. Ähm, da wir jetzt gleich über das Projekt The Enemy sprechen werden, das ein sehr groß angelegtes und ähm, ja, also das hat, ist auch ein Projekt, das eine ganz andere Denkweise ähm, hat und darüber wird er auch dann sprechen, wollen wir den Trailer erstmal zeigen, damit ihr so einen so einen Einblick bekommt, worum geht es eigentlich. Und nur mit diesem Einblick kann man dann eigentlich auch dem Interview folgen. Und das Interview wird, wird auf Englisch sein, wie ihr jetzt ja gerade schon gesehen habt. Und ich denke, wir zeigen jetzt erstmal den Trailer und dann spreche ich nochmal mit Karim über, die, über diese groß angelegte Produktion The Enemy, die er mit im MIT Open Documentary Lab entwickelt hat, mit anderen Wissenschaftlern auch zusammen. Aber jetzt erstmal Trailer. This project was born out of frustration as a photojournalist. I have covered conflicts for the last 15 years, and I knew I could not just do the same when I became a father. Yet, I was not done with trying to understand wars. My friend in Israel, when they know I'm heading for Gaza, cannot help themselves but to wish me luck and to stay safe. They believe a lot of people in Gaza are irrational. But also when I spend weeks in Gaza working, and I'm about to return to Israel, My Palestinian friends are telling me exactly the same. Just be careful there. So there is a bigger story than the war itself, and perhaps this is the one I need to explore and share. This project is rooted in my experience going from one side to the other in many different wars and conflicts, finding that people's dreams, hopes, and nightmares are often more similar than they are different. Who's your enemy? For the audience to understand and feel that, we will use artificial intelligence, cognitive science, and the latest technologies in virtual realities. Here is the concept. The Oculus Rift is a virtual reality headset. It blocks your vision and places you in a virtual world that we are creating. Fox Harrell, a professor, and Emil Bruno, a researcher, both from the MIT, will provide the analytical backbone. When the audience walks in between enemies, we will measure bias and how they physiologically respond to the installation. And in using neuroscience research, we could be able to discover how much empathy has been created. I am planning to bring the fighters of seven other long-standing conflicts together in the very same way. You create an enemy as a kid without having met your enemy because the society around you has created an enemy in the other. So the question is, could I be you if I was on the other side? Okay, uh, we just watched your trailer, so let's talk about um, the enemy first and then move on to MIT. How did you develop, how did you come to develop the idea to the enemy? What's the story behind that? Um, as, as, uh, as the trailer said, probably, and you must have understand, I've been um, a photojournalist for the longest time, I mean, the longest time, being 18 years, and um, um, I think along my career, my idea first going out and, 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 and doing this work was trying, really trying to have an impact, not only being a witness, but also have an impact on the ground. And, um, and, and something the audience might not be aware, but when journalists on the ground, especially visual journalists like, uh, like, like me or my colleagues, 
are on the ground, um, we get to be accepted by the people on the ground at the time where they have, it's the worst time of their life. And if they take us on board at that time, if they accept us going around, it's because they believe we can have an impact. Not because just we, you know, we, we're there and we have the courage to be there and just being a witness. I mean, to some extent, being a witness is already important for them. But there is this kind of unspoken contract um, that, is, that is really um, not fulfilled on my side. And not because I, I, I could not fulfill it, but just because the system wasn't allowing it. Um, but it takes time to realize this, because first you're trying to reach the audience. So working for the best paper, and when we're talking about Germany, I've worked extensively with Stern Magazine. Um, given that I work for Stern Magazine, I reach a lot of people. Um, but by the time I send my photos from Baghdad, they publish the photos, just a few of them. Um, then it gets to be seen by you guys there, and then you have put pressure on the government, and then the government put pressure on another government. It takes age, and by that time, the people that I met have moved on in their life, um, in the best case scenario, and in the worst case scenario, and not even there to, um, to, to see eventually if there would be any impact. And I think that, that that's something that has really, um, not, I mean, affected me to some extent, but really made me really unhappy because I've been trying to reach those audiences and realize the system wasn't allowing me to have this impact. Um, so it's like, you know, when in life you have frustration, there's not so many roads you can take. Either you drop them, either you try to redesign the system. Um, the good thing is we live in a time of disruptions, so you can at least start thinking that you can disrupt something in the world. Um, so so have, you point, tested, have you tested your idea? The idea I, that's behind it? Yeah, do you have like a prototype that you test on people and you and see how they react to your um, absolutely, to the inter yeah. to, to the interaction? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't have empirical um, statistics or data, uh, but I have emotional responses because we're still in the prototype stage with the, with the work, uh, but we had um, about a thousand people going through, um, and from their body language to the self-reported um, uh, feedbacks that it can give us after the experience, we realize that closer they are from the conflict and more powerful is the work. Um, for the, the reason being is that they're walking towards the audience, uh, the, the enemy, sorry. Uh, and that in real life, you wouldn't walk towards your enemy. You would step, you would walk away uh, because your enemy is your enemy and he could harm you. Uh, at least that's what has been said. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it works. To which extent it works and to what kind of empathy has been created is, 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 uh, is, is something that we're going to be working on with scientists at the MIT to try to figure out uh, more on the neuro neuroscience part how affected we are by the work and, and what, what, what has been triggered in your, in your, in your brain. And, and if you created empathy, what kind of empathy? I mean, um, I'm, I'm talking to the audience here, but if you see someone in the streets begging um, and if you don't reach to your pocket, that doesn't mean you haven't created an empathy for that person. So there is different kind of empathy, and, and, and more than that, there is an empathy for your own group that can reinforce and fuel the conflict. Because if you suddenly feel, feel more sympathy for your own people, as opposed to the enemy, uh, then you end up doing the opposite of what you wanted to do. Mm, that seems like a big step. I see all these pictures behind you. What, uh, what's the meaning of these? Who are these people, basically? Who Those are people they? are the yeah. people in the installation. I'm actually calling you from Paris. Uh, at the production company, and uh, and those are the four fighters we've met. So it's Abu Khaled and uh, from Palestine, Gilad from Israel, uh, Jean de Dieu from the FDLR group, armed group in uh, uh, in Eastern Congo, and Passion, uh, who's uh, who's the last one on my um, uh, this one. Yeah, I can see the screen. Here, this one, uh, Passion, who's a soldier from the government. Um, and they are for today the protagonists of the of the work and the people you can meet and, uh, and, and listen to uh, in, in the installation. How did you find them? Well, that's the easy part. <laughs> uh, it sounds like the hard part for you guys, but uh, being a war correspondent means reaching out to those people and, and finding ways to get on the ground. Um, you know, the reality of a war uh, is, is very different from what you can perceive from the outside. Um, let's just give me an example. When I was covering war in Iraq, I would spend half of my time focusing on positive stories and half of my time focusing on what was going wrong. 
And the positive stories were birth, uh, wedding, business picking up after years of embargo in, in Iraq. Um, so it's always different realities. And, and my job is to reach out to uh, the people that are actually making either the trouble or fighting or finding a reason to engage in the fight and, and spend time with them and trying to understand, give them a voice. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm always agree with the world they want to leave, even far from it, because I'm, I'm really specialized in insurgencies and, and Mujahideen groups. Um, but, um, but not giving them a voice is, is, is the opposite of what we want to do, because we need to understand who they are, um, where they come from, what they have in their mind in order to be able to um, understand them. And if we understand them, then we can create maybe another world um, along with their ideas. So, but you're, you're talking to um, these people that you meet and they're they're fighters, right? I mean, they yes. they kill yeah, people. They're active fighters. <laughs> they're active fighters. They kill people. Especially if you look at, at war in Congo, um, <clears throat> it seems very brutal. Um, so in a way, you're also trying to show us that they have a human side that we don't see on the media, on, me, on, on television or so. Um, how do you Absolutely. bring out that human side? Do you have a set of questions that are always the same? Well, and Thank you for the question. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty easy. Two reasons. First, I see them as human. So my entry point with those people is, yes, they've killed. Um, yes, they've done horrible things. Uh, but, but, but just stopping there is cutting the conversation and cutting the understanding. Uh, and there is always underlying reason. Um, so the, 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 my, my entry point is I see them as human. And, and secondly, I'm not asking them to talk about the other. I'm asking them to talk about themselves. And I'm asking the same set of questions on both sides. And having, um, asking the fighters what is their hope, what is their fears, where they project themselves in 20 years from now, is bringing from them uh, an element in them that becomes very similar to their enemies. Um, while if I would be asking them to talk about the other, they would be in the narrative they've been subjected to. Um, let me remind you that in order to kill people, you need to dehumanize them. And um, uh, <laughs> uh, excuse me, just a second. Okay, super. Well, the, 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 the headphones. Yeah, super. I hear you. Um, uh, in order to kill, you need to dehumanize. Mm. And you don't dehumanize on your own. The society around you dehumanizes. Um, uh, and, and I'm not denying what's going on in the world. There is war. There is people killed. There is horrible things that are happening. But there is always a history to that. And I think it's really hard to, to distinguish yourself from your own history and to back up and to realize that actually the other is more than what you've been told. Let me give you an example. A 13-year-old girl in Gaza has seen three brutal wars. She has never met an Israeli. So she's not, in, she's not able to counter the narrative of what she hears and what she's seen. So meaning, if I meet her and I can tell her that, you know, the Israeli, they've got long fingers, they've got really long teeth and they suck blood, she would be able to believe that. Because everything she's seen would correlate, or everything she experienced would correlate this horrible thing that I just said. Uh, and obviously, Israeli are not like this. Uh, things are happening on the ground and there is bad people, angry people. I'm trying to bring out the human side of us. Oh, yeah. okay. He's um, trying to cut through the stories. Obviously, when you talk about war, mm. you talk about an extreme. You talk about a demonization that pushes you to kill. Mm -hmm. um, but you and I, Astrid, are dehumanizing people as well. So we're not engaging in fighting, but we're full of stereotypes. And, and the audience here is full of stereotypes, and this is the way we live. But the more interesting way to live is to challenge our stereotypes and to start looking at the other in a different way. So it's not easy to do. And I don't think the media helps doing this. And I don't think our surrounding helps doing it. Plus, we have very busy life. We're full of pressure. We need to make money. We need to survive. We need to educate our kids. So we don't, we don't always have the time to do this. But my job as a journalist, as a storyteller, is probably to bring the invisible. Um, I've seen something to bring the invisible, to become, to make it visible. And, and, and this is what I'm trying. So the audience walks in between. I'm not telling them what to think. I'm just telling them, rethink what has been told to you. 
So when did you start to develop the idea that you would turn this into a project? Either a film or, like you're doing now, a um, virtual reality project? Um, well, that had started with... So the work existed as a photographer. Um, I did get tired of doing wide-angle photographs, going on front lines, moving with the fighters, um, getting shot at and getting bombed and taking a huge amount of risk. As I said in the trailer, when I had my daughter in 2009, I realized I couldn't do the same um, because she hasn't choose what I do and I choose to have her. So this is a simple, basic thing. Um, and that has triggered me thinking differently. So I decided to do portraits exactly like behind me, but just that, and record the fighters um, and record the answers and ask the same answers on both sides. So that was a photo installation. And the idea would be on one wall, you have a portrait. On the other wall, you have his enemy. They're looking at each other photographically, kind of. And in between, in the hallway, you have a border. And when you step on one side of the border, you hear one fighter talking. When you step on the other side, you hear the, uh, you hear the other fighter talking. When I was invited at DMIT very early on in my fellowship, actually three weeks into my fellowship, um, um, I was invited to a presentation of a small company back then, which was called Oculus, mm -hmm. uh, which is building headsets for virtual reality, and it really cracked a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the problem of real, uh, virtual reality. And when I walked in, I had vertigo. So don't tell anyone, but I had vertigo. And um, they put me, so I, I put the headsets, and I was on the side of a mountain. It was snowing, but I could look down. And even though I was in office, I looked down, and I had my vertigo triggering me. And I said, okay, this is tricking my mind. This is a very powerful medium. I put it out, because I don't like to have vertigo. Like, you know, <laughs> put that out. And walked out of the presentation, and came back 10 minutes later. With boom, and I was asking, like, what if the guys that are on the wall as photographs would actually be in a room? What if you have the body language? You see, also in our, in our life, we make sense of the people, not only through what they say, but through the body language. And that's not something that we're conscious about. But every day, as we walk in the streets, we look at the people, uh, when we interact with people, their body language needs to be in line with what they say. And if it's not, then we find the people weird, or we've got a feeling that that person is, is something is, is not matching. It, it's a totally unconscious thing. But what if you bring this in journalism? You bring a huge amount of information that was never been available, not only me as a photojournalist, but even on the TV, you, don't, you, 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 can, you cannot figure out the body language on the TV. <coughs> so, or, or just, just a limited body language you can understand. But here, you have someone in front of you who's talking to you, who's addressing you in the eyes. Even if you move around like this or like this, he's still talking to you. Uh, and that changed the perception we have of mm -hmm. people. If you add on this, that this guy is your enemy, and you've been told since you are born that this person is dangerous to you, is irrational, unpredictable, and you still walk towards that people, and you listen to him, the story comes in in a very different way. And I think it becomes very powerful. Um, so what, it, what exactly it does, it's hard to say. I mean, I can see a lot of emotions. I can see people taking the story in a different way. As, as a matter of fact, we did a presentation at the MIT about a month ago, and I couldn't interact with everyone going through the installation. But I did get a message from someone who defined himself as a Zionist. And he said, I've never felt compassion for Palestinians until I walk in the enemy. And it's not just listening to his enemy. It's been the act of walking towards his enemy. It's not something that he's ever done. And you in a virtual reality space, but you know everything you look at is real. I'm a journalist, so the body language is not an interpretation of how he moves, how it's really him. And, um, and people are aware of this when they walk into the installation. I'm not an artist, I'm a journalist. And, and, and with that in mind, they realize that the interaction is, is very powerful. And what they say are very simple. And they're talking about them. They're not pointing with their fingers towards the enemy. They're talking about their hope, their dreams, their fears. And this is shared by both sides. You see, in war, both sides are scared like shit of each other. So that's the idea. For the language. That's... <laughs> but they are. Yeah. And that triggers violence. Mm. If you can bring a little bit of that 
and a little bit of the other, then you put fuel out of the conflict. And that's my tiny, minuscule contribution to the conflict. But again, I go back to my frustration that I had as a photojournalist, and this is my way of addressing this. It's my way of being true with myself and with what I went out in this world and tried to do. Um, so um, it's an experimentation. I'm adventurous. I mean, if I can go to war, I can also rethink what I do and try to wonder if what I was doing was right or not. And I cannot tell you it's going to change the war. I cannot tell you I'm going to stop war because that's probably not going to happen. But I'm here to make things that are invisible visible to the people I can most impact, which is the next generation of fighters. So everything that we design, everything that we think about with the team is really into that direction. How can we bring this back to the next generation of fighters where we can have an impact? I mean, as much as I'd like to influence your audience, you also not my target audience. I want the 16 years old kids in Gaza or in Israel or in El Salvador or in Congo to reevaluate what has been taught to him about the other. And if he's got a meeting with his enemy, that might happen. So you brought this idea. Two years if it did work. So you brought this idea to the MIT Open Documentary. Um, how far advanced was your project by the time? How did you? It wasn't advanced at all. It was a concept. It was a face to face. It was not even in re uh, virtual reality at that point. Um, I was invited on the premise that I would think in other medium, and they told me, "Come, please, carry." And your project is very simple. Anyone can understand it. I think it's, 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 it's pertinent to the world we live in. But think differently than you've been thinking before. And it's exactly what the MIT has offered me. And I publicly say there, thank you very much for doing so. Because sometimes you need people in your life to break the walls you've got around you. And in that case, for me, the MIT has really been instrumental in, 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 in pushing the boundaries away. And, and the way I was perceiving my own work um, suddenly, I was interacting with scientists, uh, with engineers, uh, with, with, with people that have come from a very different world, but I have the same goal as I do. Um, and, and, and finally, I, I create content. I mean, I create, I'm a journalist, so I go out and I bring information. Those information can be used by scientists and by engineers to turn either the technology or the science into something much more concrete. So it's an exchange. I mean, as much as they inform me about my work and they help me break the walls of all the, the way I perceive the world and, and how I can interact with this world, um, I'm also helping them understanding what they do better because it's really with my content, they can push research and with their research, I can understand better what I do. And in, in this way, everyone becomes more efficient. So it's really the base of a collaboration with the MIT um, that is exciting. Um, anyone who's ready to be challenged, anyone who's open-minded to say, I might have been wrong or I might not have been as efficient as I was willing to be, um, then the MIT is a great place. So you were saying that you worked together with neurosciences in, for this project? Yes, correct. I mean, neuroscience will come in the second stage. They need the work to be completed. But I want, and in that case, Emile Bruno, who's a neuroscience working on reconciliation, um, who's really close on the work, um, kind of overlook the work that we do to make sure that everything we do is also something we can work with. But building what we do, we're working with Fox Harrell. Um, he's um, a cognitive scientist. He's, he's, he's a brilliant brain, mind. And he's out in this world to do exactly what I do, but it comes from a very different background, which is artificial intelligence and cognitive science. He believes technologies can help us be better human beings, um, and, um, and artificial intelligence can help us realize things that we wouldn't have realized. So to some extent, it can put us apart, it can isolate us, and with other ways of interacting and getting into this, it can also help us realizing more things about the other. And so we're working together. So when you are in the enemy, you're actually being tracked, but not tracked like you would be on Facebook. We're not here to sell you something. We're here to understand how your interaction with the installation is happening. And what is the distance you have with one fighter as compared to the other? Where do you look one fighter as opposed to the other? How do you physiologically respond to that? And we can because it's, 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 it's all real, but it's also, we can also personalize the work. 
And to give you an example, I mean, that's not the case, but that, 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 that will be kind of clear, I hope clear enough for the audience, that if you work in a space and in, in, you start being stressful and you don't have any roof above you, it's, 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 it's not a closed room, it's, it's a room where you have a sky, um, that this, the second room where you, you walk in could be more sun, something much more warm that reinsure you a little bit. So we can, by tracking you, we can also help you feeling more comfortable. All goal being, feel the other better. Get closer to the other. Challenge yourself. And for this, if you stress, we'll make you more comfortable. Mm. So it's a personalization. So you and I ask you to walk in this, because we're different people with different backgrounds, won't have the same exact experience. Mm. So if someone here in the audience would like to apply to MIT Open Documentary Lab, how would they do that? <clears throat> well, I think they need to send an email to Sarah, or to William. Sarah Wallace, who's the director, or William, who's William Enricchio, who's a professor at the MIT. It sounds very simple, but it's all about the heart. Uh, and it's all about saying, listen, I want to be challenged. I've got this project. I need to move forward. I'm ready to be, I'm ready to be you know, put upside down. But my goal is this. I want to do that. I want to, you know, whatever, you're a filmmaker. Um, it's not only been about being a storyteller, by the way. You can do a research on impact. Um, you can figure out new methodology for building a story on, on the web. I mean, it's like, you know, this is a new world to some extent. There's a lot of things to be done in this. And the Open Documentary Lab, being an academic institution, is there to try to define words that we know, like documentary, but see what documentary means in the world of today. What is a documentary piece online? Is what I do in VR a documentary? Journalism. And how do we define this? Um, and same for the impact. Um, and so those are entry points. Uh, and I really encourage people to check out the people who've been fellow at the work, what they've been doing, how they are thinking. I mean, most of us have um, kind of an extensive presence online. And, 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 and you can find out more about what I've done in the past, because internet has been the internet. You've got things from 10 years ago. Uh, and, and see how we've moved. With our, with, our, with our work and, and how we've been engaging the world around us and, and what is the MIT bringing us individually. So after you applied to MIT, you moved to, to uh, Massachusetts? Or, and yeah, you, I did. You stay on campus then? You, you're um, um, so it's artist in residence, is that how it works? I was actually invited at Harvard University um, a year before the MIT. Uh, in a, a journalism fellowship. It's actually the most prestigious fellowship for journalists. And you go there and you study for a year, wherever you want, at the MIT if you want, but you're affiliated with Harvard, so most likely you study at Harvard, and you can study, you can even go to the medicine school. You can go to the, I've been to the law school, I've been spending extensive time at the business school, um, uh, the Kennedy school, you can, I mean, it's like so many things to learn. And when you get to my age, when you're around 40, uh, suddenly going back to school is not going back to school when you're 18 or 20, where you're trying to figure out the world. I have to figure out the world. No, I'm interacting with like an academic knowledge that is so different than mine, and then putting this in perspective with my own work was really good. But then I met people at the MIT, they understood about the work I was doing, and then really invited me and says, please, come and think with us. Uh, let's move this whole thing forward, and you can bring us something, and we can bring you something. So it's really a collaboration. So they actually helped you within a year to develop the project, so you can go out and uh, yeah. As show a matter of fact, they, 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 it. it was a one-year fellowship, but then they didn't want to let me go, so they signed me up for another year with the Open Doc Lab. <laughs> and when the Open Doc Lab says, like, well, you know, we love to keep you, but we cannot keep people for more than two years. Then another uh, lab that was the Center for Art, Science, and Technology at the MIT again, that says, oh, he's going away, we want him. <laughs> so I'm, I'm there until 2018 uh, with, um, yeah, I have no intention of going away until they push me out, which they always do at school at some point in my life. Um, and yeah, so I'm still, I'm still at the MIT in a different lab, but um, I'm still interacting with, you know, with the same people to some extent. It's, it's a big and it's a small community. It depends how you look at it and how you engage it. Um, the, the other day I called you, you were in Washington, D.C., so MIT helped you to get into contact with people that are either financing you or that are important for networking? Is 
Is that true? Part of it is the networking things, um, but the networking values only if you have something to say to the people or something they have something to tell you. Uh, and in, 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 in a sense that it's about, it's a knowledge based in the networking. Um, so yeah, they, they, they've, done, they, they've introduced me to a lot of different places. I think it's also been showing a lot of people down at the MIT that it supposedly know what I'm doing, which is obviously you keep it for you again, but I'm not sure what I'm doing. Um, and, uh, but in that sense, the MIT is instrumental, but it's also how you go out with the work. And with this, I need to say that I'm working with a production company in Paris who's helping me out putting this together. I'm working with the National Film Board in Canada, who's a co-producer, and France Television here in Paris also, who's the main founder of the work. Um, so as, as of today, it's about 100 people working on the project. So, I mean, not full time, of course. I will, this is not Hollywood, I'm not shooting a movie. Uh, but it's 100 people interacting with the work, bringing their knowledge and their expertise. Um, there's so much I know, uh, and so much more other people know. So it's about trying to put people together, also to, uh, you know, behind the same ID and, and, and bringing the best of them to make this happen. So um, you're talking about already um, uh, shooting in Israel and Palestine and, and that's your demo in a way, that's your prototype, right? I have Congo also, I've done Congo. Oh, okay. And how many more countries are you going to do? I'm going to do one more countries and um, I'm supposed to be leaving in two weeks for El Salvador, uh, doing the Mahas. So that, those are the gangs in El Salvador. Um, it's a long story. The Mahas are um, criminal gangs that are, have been created during the civil war. And during the civil war, you had a lot of refugees. The refugees from Salvador went alone in the U.S. In the U.S., they kind of get organized as gangs much more the way they are today. And they were uh, expelled from, uh, most of them were expelled from, uh, from the U.S. and brought back to Salvador, but then also Honduras and Guatemala. And they've reproduced the same dynamic of gangs um, from the U.S. in their own countries, and they've become they've become a cancer to the society. Uh, they've become so powerful. Uh, but those are, those are very it's a war, but it's a, it's it's a gang war. So it's not Israel Palestine or it's not Congo. It's a different approach. But the the, the fact that when you're born in one street and you're part of one gang. If you would have been born four streets from there, you would have been part of the other gang. So again, the enemy has been given to you without you having a choice about it. Um, and, uh, and this is what interests me. We inherit a lot of things in our life that we haven't choose. Um, we don't choose where we were born. We choose what we can do with our life. Uh, and, and that's what I want to challenge. It says you might not have seen something from the other side. And this is my job to bring it there. How do you address the, the enemies, how do you, if, with, with the project that you've developed, how is it going to be? You go to, let's see, El Salvador, and then you, t you bring those two parties together? I don't bring them together. If I bring them together, I'd be in trouble, because the, the, the chance that they're shooting each other within the <laughs> studio would be pretty big. So I'm always <laughs> filming um, the fighters individually, and depending on the countries, it would even be in different places. In Israel and Gaza, I had to go to Gaza to meet Abu Khaled and film there, and then I had to go in Israel to film uh, Gilad. Uh, Congo was a little different, was much more sketchy, um, in a way that I had to smuggle um, uh, numbers of fighters to the enemy territory, undercover, safe house, and then bring them to the studio. So we shoot everything in the same place. Highly risky. Um, I have a lot of stories about that, but I'm here to witness so everything went well. Uh, but it was, that was very sketchy. Um, the reason is that going into the bush wouldn't have allowed us to build up the studio and to, uh, and to, and to film and to, and to record everything we, we, we could in, the, in their own territory because they really live in small villages outside in the mountains, uh, far away from cities. And so the electricity is, uh, is, is a major source of problem. And, um, and in El Salvador, we'll be filming in different locations too because we don't want to... We don't want to have any chance that those enemies get to see each other. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a responsibility on my side to make sure that the people are good before I go there, they're good while I'm there, and they're good after I need the place. Okay. Well, if we talk about the project, um, how, how much um, is that going to cost per country or per 
uh, I can inside. give you a breakdown. I mean, the good thing is I'm, I'm, I'm the director of it, so I'm not paying so much attention to the numbers. So I can <laughs> That's good for you. <laughs> but we, we, we've, passed, uh, we've passed easily the million dollar, uh, and I think we're close to two, uh, uh, if, even maybe more. I mean, really not in numbers, but it's not so expensive. And I don't know how we've managed to raise so much money. I guess everyone can understand what we do. It's totally universal. Uh, and people in Canada, in the U.S. Foundation, in the U.S., um, and of course here in France, have been really responsive to uh, to the work. I think the component of me seeking to have <coughs> excuse me uh, to to have a way to read the impact and to discover impact, and it's a very different one. So not self-reported. It's not like okay, Astrid, you go through and I says, how was it? And you tell me it was great. Um, it, it's been a, a really profound experience, let's say, put it this way. It's not enough for me. Um, so I'm bringing scientists to understand how we react. Uh, and because those are scientists, they're going to publish paper about it. And we're all going to find out. I'm going to be naked, guys, um, as it works or it doesn't work. And, uh, and, and that, that's what I want to do because what I do, I want others, once I'm done my, my work, to see my success and my failure, mm. where it does work and where it doesn't work. And so people can build on this work and move the needle forward. So I'm going, just going to ask you one more question and then I will ask the audience if they want to come up here and talk to you as well. Sure. Uh, we'll my, la my last question is, uh, where would you like to be with your project next year around June? With the target audience, with the next generation of fighters. I want to be with them. I want to see how they react to this. I want to see if they shift perspective. I want to have science in it, uh, integrated science in within the within the project, so we can assess if what we do works. Um, I want to be on the ground. I want to I want to finally see if I have an impact. Mm. I cannot tell you I will. Mm. I mean, yes, self-reported. Mm. I can tell you I had one, but I want to see deeper than that. I want to understand, you know, if 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 finally I can bring a change. Mm. And it doesn't have to be stopping a war. It, 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 it can just be someone who says, well, the story I've been told about my enemy is not the full story. I've seen something else in it, and I've decided not to join the fight. It's a grassroots movement, because if, if you see, I mean, I, I, in the work and the people behind me are simple soldiers. They don't think the war. They do the war. They are designed and trained to fight each other. They're not there to wander. They're not there to think intellectually what the war means and how they're going to win this war. They're there to get a meter forward, to gain territory. Um, and it's a very technical thing uh, and tactical thing. So in a year from now, I want to be close to my audience. I want to see them. And hopefully, I want to see a change happening. Mm. Well, it's a very ambitious and a very big pro pro uh, project. So I think it would take many, many years to see yeah. uh, the impact. Just, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's gonna be. Yeah, it's 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 gonna take some time, but I'm willing to give this. Yeah, I'm willing yeah. to give that time. I hope it works. Obviously, I don't want to realize five years down the line that it was it was not as impactful as 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 we all hoped. I'm not the only one. Everyone in the team and everyone interacting with the work from close or far hope this is working mm -hmm. because then it becomes the magical story of a simple face to face. Yeah, being something very efficient. Well, I hope so. That works that your project works. I wish you all the best for that. I will ask the audience now if anyone wants to come up and then I'll come sure. back to you. Don't shy, guys. <laughs> Don't there is, um, is anyone in the audience who wants to talk to Karim Ben Khalifa? So you have the, ch uh, the chance right now. But you have to come up here because otherwise he can't see you. <clears throat> oh, come on, guys. Some courage. Everyone's shy. <laughs> I don't know. Do you guys see me? I don't even know if you. If you guys can see me. I guess I'm okay. in the street. Yeah. The very courageous person is coming up and wanting to talk to you. Fantastic. <laughs> Come on, guys. If I'm courageous to go and meet fighters. Hello, oh. hello, Karim. Hello, Karim. Hello. hello, Karim. My name is Manfred. I'm also here involved in in in, in our two-day symposium. It was great to, to, to listen to everything you told us about your project. There's one thing which I'm not sure whether I caught it correctly. Maybe you could tell me. Um, 
you told us, and I understood, that you cannot bring the fighters of the different enemy camps together, because obviously they would kill each other. But you want to have an impact. So will you show your project to anybody of the four fighters we see behind you? Will you show it to them? Because that would, for me, be the first step of creating conscience. I've done it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your question. I think it's quite important. Thank you for coming up on stage. Okay. Um, I will leave the space again to Alfred and you tell me. And take okay. care. Okay. okay. So, yeah. Uh, so, Manfred, thank you for your question. Um, I haven't had the chance to show it to the Congolese fighters, but I, I've interacted with Gilad and, uh, and Abu Khaled. They've seen each other. They've listened to each other through the installation. Um, and let me give you um, an anecdote story. When we did and filmed Israel Palestine, it was in May 2014. We had no idea, and you guys might remember that in July and August 2014, there was a war in Gaza. Gilad was sent back to Gaza. Abu Khaled was in Gaza. And a friend of mine in Israel, who also happened to be a friend of Gilad, sent me a text message. I was on holiday in France sent me a text message and says, you know your face to face? It's happening right now. And because I knew the war was happening, I understood that the subtext of that message was Gilad is back in Gaza. So for weeks I had no news from either Gilad or Abu Khaled. I was biting my nails. I was on holiday, but I was extremely stressed. Comes August, mid-August. I call Abu Khaled. He's okay. He's wounded, slightly wounded. But his family is okay. And he's okay. Obviously very shocked by the war. I called Gilad. Gilad is okay. He's slightly wounded too. His family is okay. But then Gilad asked me a strange question. And you guy, how are you doing? And I was like, Gilad, I was on holiday in Southern France. I was not waging a war against my enemy for 45 days. But I understood that when he asked me that question, it was to ask another question. And that other, other question was, how's Abu Khaled? He started creating an empathy for Abu Khaled. He started taking, not taking care of him, but he, he went as deep as where was he? Was he in the north of Gaza or the south of Gaza? He wanted, because Gilad finally was in the north of Gaza. Abu Khaled was in the north of Gaza, and they wanted to know, I mean, especially Gilad wanted to know if by any accident he could have been the one who killed Abu Khaled. And he wanted to reassure himself that he didn't do that. And Abu Khaled was okay, wounded, but okay. And that's it. I mean, that's the power of the work. And that's something I wasn't expecting. So my phone was like, what? You care for your enemy? I was, that was the first step. So my target audience, Manfred, is to bring it to the next generation of fighters. It's not to make the people who fight today stop. I could be a, a secondary audience. But it's not my primary audience. I want to have an impact on the people who haven't started fighting yet. Um, but that shows me that eventually I can have an impact on the people who are actually fight. They need to go through, they need to be willing to do it. And again, time will tell me if that works or not. So when you talk, I hope you when your you talk to the enemies, um, to, when you talk to the soldiers, um, what language do you use, or do you have a translator? Like if you go to the Congo? Well, or... Gilad, Gilad speaks English. Abu Khaled speaks Arabic, <laughs> which, which I, I speak. Um, and then with, um, with Jean de Dieu and Passion in Congo, um, I had a translator with us. Um, I know a little bit of Swahili because I'm, I used to go a lot in East Africa when I was younger, uh, but not enough to conduct an interview at all. Uh, so I had, a, I had a translator with me. Um, so Passion would speak Swahili. And uh, Jean de Dieu, who speaks one, mm -hmm. uh, who speaks Kikir one, mm -hmm. which I don't speak at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the level of education is really, really, really low, so they didn't speak French and we couldn't interact mm -hmm. in, in French or, for the matter of fact, in English. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> you see, one thing is interesting. The FDLR, you must have all, and maybe you, you're not familiar with that group, but those are the people, the Hutu, who've been killing the Tutsi during the genocide in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. After the genocide, the Tutsi took over Rwanda and pushed the Hutu out. At that point, 
Jean de Dieu was a few years old. He was not a fighter. His parents were involved in the fight, but he was not a fighter. Mm. And look, he's on this wall because he's a fighter. It's a generation after generation war. Mm. It's already the second generation. Mm. Can we let that happen? Mm. Can we not, us as storytellers, as wealthy, you know, Western people, mm. do something about it? And there is another aspect of it, and let me tell you, just you guys, I hope you're sitting. Congo has 40 million tons of gold reserved under the ground. Questions from the audience. Yeah. Right before lunch, people are getting courageous. Come up here, where are you? Bonjour. Hello. Uh, my name is Pia Engel and I'm, uh, it's my first time on the Dockville. I am doing my PhD on documentary movies um, in, in the field of rhetoric. So I'm really impressed by your aims and um, I'm really happy that, you're, uh, that you have the, this big aim to have an impact because this is my um, yeah, um, my idea of how documentaries should work, that, we, that they change the world in a rhetorical or convincing way. And that is what you showed us, um, that you make it visible. And I have a question about, um, you ask them the same questions, but how is it working in the VR? Um, I see their body language and um, do I hear you, your question and they answer yeah. or how is it working? Can I interact in a way or is it that they repeat the, the answers all the time? No, 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 no. I mean, we're trying to make it as, 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 as mostly as a real life interaction. But the thing is, and that's what I've discovered, listen guys, I was not doing VR before, so I'm learning as I'm doing. Um, but the, one of the hard things with, uh, with VR is to manage the expectation of the audience. Meaning that if you can start asking questions yourself, it has to be scripted to some extent, because I don't have all the answers of the fighter. Um, say, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't ask questions through the television because it's not live, you know, like it's, it's exactly the same thing. So you hear my voice um, asking the questions, but then the answer to you. And when I say the answer to you is they really, even if you go 45 degrees on the side or 45 degrees on the other side, they would look at the enemy, but then they would look at you and they would engage with you directly, looking you in the eyes. Um, so that, that's how we do it. In managing expectation, if I put a, a table with a glass of water, you are going to start wondering why there is a table and a glass of water. Is this a clue? of something. Do I need to take the glass? Actually, there is no glass because it's virtual reality. So you need, uh, managing the expectation is what, it's a, it's, it's a very thin line where you need to know what you're going to do. You don't want to be, I don't want you to be lost in the system and, and, and not knowing what you have to do. Uh, yet at the same time, it needs to be kind of a little bit scripted in a way that the information comes to you in a way. But when you, when the fighter appears in the room, you're free to go to one or to the other. You're someone very different than I am. Maybe Abu Khaled is someone that reinsure you and Gilad is someone that scares you or the other way around. And with this, you might make the choice that first, I'm gonna go and challenge myself with the guy who scares me. Or you might say, well, I'm gonna go slow with this and I'm gonna go to the guy I feel more comfortable with. Um, and this is you, and this is how you are. So we all carry, especially when it comes to Israel and Palestine, we know that conflict. We all carry an idea about that conflict. So everyone interacts differently and can do whatever he wants. Yet, they go through a hundred persons of the conflict. They go to interact with both fighters. Whenever they're done with one, they can go to the other one. And no, the question don't get to be repeated. Uh, once you launch questions and, and the fighter talks to you, you might even walk on the other side of the room and he, the, the fighter will talk until he's done with the answer. Now the position you have in the room, if you're closer to the other fighter, then the question will be asked to the other fighter at that point. That's how we, we've naturally triggered our, uh, the, the, the system around you. It doesn't feel like this because you're not aware of the system, so it feels very natural when you're in. Uh, but it's kind of somehow a little bit scripted. Thank you. 
My pleasure. And by the way, PhD, like what you wonder, is perfect for the MIT Open Doc Lab. <laughs> okay. okay. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Question, but I think it would also be time to say to make a little applause for you from the audience here, yeah? <laughs> because I think this is such a wonderful project. It really brings together the idea of VR and a good story. And there's not a lot of projects so far in this technology that really convince me that much. So I just have one more question about dissemination of the project. There is on the one hand the thing that you go into the field back again and show it to people who are involved into. Uh, the conflict and um, the enemies. What are you doing? How are you disseminating the project? Are you going to France Television? I, I saw uh, who is who is publishing the project. Unfortunately, I'm from out there. Mary said we don't host the project. I think I don't know if you talked to someone. I have other ideas. Let's talk about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, uh, who is involved? And did you think about I don't know? I, I just had in my mind Imperial War Museum in London or places like that that already deal with this subject or history museums or I think there's a lot of partners who could be interesting for sure. for this kind of project to to host um, it and to show it. As I said earlier, we're in time of... Uh, stay with me! It's good to you, because speaking to the black there... No, no, stay, stay, stay! Uh, okay. Um, as I said earlier, we're in a time of disruptions. So it's, it's, it's a matter of how you think and how, how you design things. So the number one thing for me is to define who's my target audience and then design everything around this target audience in a way that I can reach it. Um, and in that case, we are um, partnering with a reconciliation and peace building organization that has the access and the expertise to get on the ground in Congo, in Nigeria, in Lebanon, in Gaza, in Israel. And in, in that case, it's an organization that works in 36 countries um, that are at war, that works with media. Um, so it's a media that's uh, uh, interactions and program. Uh, and they usually do it with radio or television, reality show or theater. And suddenly they saw this new technology and they saw the project and this is like, this is totally something we could use on the ground. So you need to, uh, as, as, as a photojournalist, I would rely on the distribution of Stern magazine or the New York Times magazine to reach my audience. Here, I need to define who's my audience because I can choose, and in that case, next generation of fighters, and then partner with an organization that we actually, we give them the work. Like, as, as much as it is expensive, we give them the work. The only thing we ask them is to uh, make sure uh, they allocated a budget for translation uh, that we can integrate ourselves. So Kine Rwanda, Kiswahili, that would come to Congo, so the users can actually understand that. And um, uh, so, yeah, it's defining um, new ways of distribution. And in that case, all the partners are okay. They, from the very start, is the DNA of the project, next generation of fighters. But let me remind you something. Germany is at war, France is at war, the US is at war, the UK is at war, and more and more we can see actually that they are at war at home here, it comes back home. Um, so after what happened in Paris, you had a peak in people volunteering to go and join the army. So this work is also very, very important to be shown here. So basically we have two sets, two installations, one that goes to the countries at war, in the third world countries, where you need an organization that has the reach to the next generation of fighters, that has the expertise, meaning they have four-wheel drive, they have generators, um, they understand the technology, and they can bring it to the people directly. And on the other side, we have what we have here with the production, the tracking system, and all the headsets, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and everything you need logistically around that. And we're going to go to New York, we're going to go, I hope, soon to Germany, um, uh, to Paris, to Montréal, uh, to Seoul, to Rio, and that will be the other part of distribution of the book. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so good luck and uh, a lot of energy. <laughs> yes, thank you. The question is okay now, okay? Okay. Um, thank you very much for sharing the project with us and also your connection. Thank you for inviting me and reminding us that we're watching incredible things going on in this world and that things should be done, that people should actually start acting. So thank you very well, much.
And we give you a hand. Thank you. I said, I said last thing, and I think you said it. It's, uh, it's Gandhi who said that, but be the change you want to see in the world. That's very true. Good luck with you have your, a good day. Good luck with your project, and we will follow Thank it. You. We will follow you. Super. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.